Okay, well, as folks trickle in, um, we'll continue to say hello, um, but I think we'll go ahead and get started because we have uh, a lot of great stuff to learn from our panelists today. So welcome everybody to our session that is focused on civic learning and democratic engagement at liberal arts colleges specifically. Um, I'm Kathy Wolf. I'm the Vice President for Academic Affairs at Roanoke College, which is a liberal arts college in Southwest Virginia. I've been here for all of eight months, so still learning a lot about how things work uh, at Roanoke. Um, so I'm going to let my presenter colleagues introduce themselves briefly. And as they do, if you would please, um, in the chat, go ahead and introduce yourselves to us um, and to one another. So I'm just going to go in the order that you all are on my screen. So Bill, you are up first. Hi, I'm Bill Gunderson. I'm at Hendricks College, a liberal arts college in Conway, Arkansas. I'm an associate professor of chemistry, and I'm also the director of our uh, Odyssey program. Great. Thanks, Bill. Andrew. Hi, my name is Andrew Isaac. I am a senior lecturer in the communication department at Santa Clara University in Northern California, and I'm also the director of the core curriculum. Thanks. Phil. Hi, everybody. I'm Philip Motley. I'm at Elon University, which is in Central North Carolina. I'm an associate professor of communication design and also our current faculty fellow for service learning and community engagement. Thanks. And Carrie. Hi, everyone. Uh, Karen, I'm Carrie Eves, and I am um, an associate professor of political science here at Elon University. I come along with Philip. We have sort of dual roles. We come as a pair, and I also serve as the faculty fellow for civic engagement. All right. Thanks, everyone. And I want to give a shout out to Natalie Frillet. She is our liaison from Campus Compact, who is serving as our very, very helpful tech guru today. So thanks, Natalie, for, for your help as we go through the session. Um, I'm chairing the session, I think, um, in part because I've worked with the AACNU for a number of years, and I've also worked on kind of curricular and advising reform at several different liberal arts colleges, um, all of which take slightly different approaches and are at different stages of implementing civic learning and, and democratic engagement. Um, I started out at Fort Lewis College Public Liberal Arts in, in Colorado. That was long enough ago that I think they've progressed so far that I, I won't discuss what we were doing there then because I think it's probably very different now. Um, but I can say that at um, Nebraska Wesleyan University in Lincoln when I was there, we did an audit of what we called our global learning general education program. And the audit showed that, you know, while there was a whole lot of good work happening with regard to global and civic learning, it was not very difficult for students to graduate having missed a lot of it um, because there weren't a whole lot of structures in place um, to help them integrate that, that learning. So we overhauled general education. We integrated thematic areas and in the majors. We scaffolded content and skills and practices over four years. Um, that included two stages of experiential learning and a required capstone um, in the discipline. And at Hamilton College, which is where I was the last couple of years, my role was to integrate um, really advising and student support areas that had been really, really siloed previously. Um, and at Hamilton, there are no requirements outside the major, aside from a required writing course, quantitative reasoning, and, and some wellness courses. Um, but students get really civically involved in undergraduate research through the Levitt Public Affairs Center there. They do service learning through the Community Outreach and Opportunity Project. There's a really active voter registration initiative they call Ham Votes, and the president has a common ground um, lecture series. And then here at Roanoke College, um, we have kind of a Bonner style civic engagement fellows program, Institute for Public Opinion Research, project-based general education capstone, centers for community health innovation and studying structures of race, speaker series that's focused on civic leadership and a lot of other curricular and co-curricular opportunities. Um, but at Roanoke as at Hamilton, there are pockets of really good work happening, but no intentional civic framework yet to sort of help us connect the dots. Um, and so this is partly why we have our panelists here today, who I think are maybe a little bit further along. So along with you, I am looking for advice um, from them. But I want to frame a little bit whether it's focused on civic learning 
um, or other goals, I think about the organizational change processes we use to get there through the lens of adaptive leadership, right? This is kind of a, a pretty well-known framework um, articulated, championed by Ron Heifetz um, and some other scholars. And today we're going to hear from our colleagues at Elon and Hendricks and Santa Clara about how changes on their campuses really have, I think, built on what was working well while still rearranging probably some important institutional DNA, right? I am thinking to get where you are, probably those change processes um, involved rearranging some structures, some beliefs, priorities, habits, loyalties, um, and all of those things, right? So adaptive change, like adaptation in organisms, adaptation in, in organizations takes time, and it happens through experimentation, and that comes with the risk of failure as well as success sometimes. Um, it requires a lot of new learning. It values diverse perspectives. And I think what's key about it is that adaptive organizational change should enable our institutions and our students to thrive. So as our internal conditions change, as our external conditions shift, the change needs to be ongoing, right? It's never just one and done. So accordingly, we'll also hear from colleagues, I think, about how they seek to continually improve their practices. Um, and of course, we will set aside time um, at the end for all of you to engage with these great folks in, in Q&A. So I want to start um, with a brief summary from each of our three institutions about kind of their why and their what. So kind of the civic learning and democratic engagement opportunities in the curriculum and co-curriculum at each institution, the knowledge, skills, and experiences from that framework, and how they're grounded in mission and vision and values and student learning outcomes. So um, just a note, Natalie, if you want to help us keep each of these three responses to four or five minutes, um, that'll help us stay on time. But I want to start with Andrew at Santa Clara. So if you could start first and give us a summary. Yeah, so I just put a, I put a link in the chat to uh, the core curriculum at Santa Clara University. And um, at Santa Clara, we have um, a lot of core requirements, the general education requirements, the students have 20 to meet. That may sound like a lot, a lot. Part of the reason is we're on the quarter system. And so students have opportunities to take more classes. So 20 might translate to something like 13 or 14 uh, on a semester system. Um, but within those uh, core requirements, um, we have two in particular that are focused on civic learning and civic engagement. So we have one called civic engagement. Um, that's a, a kind of a, I don't say standard, but it's a, it's a classroom-based um, course that students have to take. Um, they have a selection of you know, 100 different classes they can take. And students also have something to take called experiential learning um, for social justice. That class takes place in the classroom, but also includes at least 16 hours over 10 weeks uh, of engagement in the community. And so those two are the, the most prominent forms of civic learning that we have in, in the curriculum. And those come, and I'll, I'll talk about this a little bit later when we talk about um, how pervasive it is in our in our curriculum, they they are grounded in the, the values of the university, the Catholic, Jesuit, and university values. And that's what they come from. Um, that is something that, um, when, the, when the core was first designed, and then when it was reorganized in, in 2009, um, all based on what the values are. And so um, that's something that um, as we're looking towards a new core, as we're in the process of thinking, what would the next one look like? What would the next iteration look like? We're often going back to the values and saying what fits into the values. We know the world has changed dramatically in the last 12, 13 years, and so has education. And we're continuing to think about how we would make those changes. In all those conversations, the ELSJ class, Experiential Learning for Social Justice, and the Civic Engagement class, there's no question those are going to be in the next core. And it's because they're so deeply embedded um, into the values uh, of the university. Thank you. That ELSJ, that sounds like something I would love to take. 
It really does. Um, and thank you for putting that link in, um, folks. You can and go and and take a look at the core curriculum at, at Santa Clara. Um, okay, Bill, I'm going to move to you next. Sure. Um, so at Hendrix, I'm going to talk about a couple of the things we do, both curricular and kind of a co-curricular program. Uh, curricularly, we have uh, a course that every freshman or every first year student takes uh, called the Engaged Citizen. I'm going to post a link here for those who are interested. Um, this is a course, it's a taught as a dyad, but it focuses on engaging citizens in the community, in the world, in many different ways. And it's all taught around some theme. Each course is themed, but again, that engagement uh, as a citizen is really important. That's based on our um, core principles, our purpose, which I'm going to read on another screen because I don't have it memorized, but a piece of it is inspiring students to live lives of accomplishment, integrity, service, and joy. And the integrity and in service in particular is something that we really value here and is an uh, important part of our curriculum and everything we do. We also have it incorporated through a number of other methods, again, through our curriculum, we have various learning domains that you have to achieve certain, certain courses. And some of those include social and behavioral ethics and values. Uh, and again, that civic engagement that comes in a lot of different ways. Sometimes people get it in their first year, sometimes a third, fourth year, uh, no student can miss it. And then finally, the kind of co-curricular version, posting yet another link, and this is where I'm heavily involved currently is our Odyssey program. Our Odyssey program is our engaged learning program at Hendrix. It doesn't focus entirely on uh, civic engagement, but one of the learning goals is increased awareness of one's responsibility for linking action and understanding an effort to respond effectively to the social, spiritual, and like ecological needs of our time. So this is always those are always evolving, always changing, and we always encourage students to participate in projects that address those um, those needs and think about kind of their place both at Hendrix, in the local community, the national community, and the global community in many different ways. Prince. Thank you. Um, I'm struck by in your purpose, I love that the word joy is in it, um, because I, I think sometimes when we talk about civic learning and, and service learning, it, it, it can get really heavy, but there's so much joy in the work done together. So I, yes. you know, I'm reminded of, you know, what Mary Piper says in the, in the green boat about just, just the joy of, of sort of battling issues in, in company with, with other people. So I love that. Thanks. And um, can okay. I just briefly state, yes. um, We've re recently revised that, and uh, actually, right before I started at Hendrix about seven years ago, but it kind of that joy was um, was still a very important thing. So, thanks for commenting on that. Excellent. Okay, Phil or Carrie, who's taking the the ball on this one? We can do both. But Carrie, you want to set us up, and and I can go after you. Sure, um, I'll start. Uh, so as I said, Philip and I have these uh, titles, faculty fellow, my role is civic engagement. Um, and most of my work is a little more co-curricular. Uh, we have really strong efforts around voter engagement and political engagement that we pride ourselves on here. We're very cognizant of making sure that those efforts don't exist only in an election year. And we are constantly planning in advance for the next semester, the next semester, whether there's an election or not, um, to sort of keep that in front of students. Uh, it's part of the university's mission. One of the pieces of the mission statement says that we want to prepare students to be global citizens and informed leaders motivated by concern for the common good. Um, so that's the, the co-curricular piece of it. I'll let Philip talk about the sort of experiential learning and the, the curricular piece that he has sort of um, more uh, sort of view over. Thanks, Carrie. Yeah, so 
so we have these two dueling roles that are that are in many ways two halves of, of a whole. Um, Carries is more focused on civic engagement and political engagement, and often is more co-curricular. Mine is maybe more on community-based learning, service learning, community engagement. It has a more overt curricular piece in the form of service learning courses for credit, but also uh, in how that manifests in what e um, Elon calls their ELRs or their experiential learning requirements. So every student, every undergrad student has to complete two of these before they graduate out of five buckets, one of which is service, service learning. Um, the other four really quickly are study abroad, internships, undergraduate research and leadership. So they have to complete two of those. It doesn't necessarily mean that they're going to complete one in the service area, uh, I'll put a link in the chat as well to that. And in, in the first one, I actually will put two in here. Um, if you notice down at the bottom, it gives some percentages of involvement in those experiences. Um, and I'm also going to put a link to a, a report that also kind of captures that just in case it's helpful in that format. But keep in mind that I think in one of them, it breaks it down a little bit further. Um, some of that service, that percentage of like, I think it's 81% of students have a service engagement. Some of that's coming through service learning courses, you know, a designed experience within a curricular setting. Some might be through volunteer hours, students volunteer with Habitat for Humanity or a variety, you know, any number of, of organizations and they can accumulate hours in that regard. And the one thing that, that Elon's done and, and other universities may do as well, and I'll post one last link here and then I'll stop, is we now provide, in addition to your, your traditional academic transcript, what we call an experiences transcript, and that um, helps capture all of those hours and those five experiences and further captures, for example, on the, on the link that I provided, you know, service, whether that's a service learning course or direct volunteering, et cetera. Thank you. Um, I want to delve into all of these now. So I think now that we've we've kind of talked about the what and the why, um, sort of what motivated um, the the schools to move in this direction and kind of where they stand at the moment, and now I want us to get a little more in depth on the the how, right? So um, where things stand with regard to intentional structures, stakeholder engagement, um, assessment, that kind of thing. Um, so Andrew, I'm going to start with you. So how pervasive um, or scaffolded would you say that civic learning or democratic engagement is? So when I'm thinking about this, I'm thinking, can any student, so whether they they start at Santa Clara or they transfer in, can any student avoid it? Um, is it mostly front-loaded early in the student's uh, time there? Is it kind of built in over the arc of the whole student experience? So it's uh, very pervasive. To answer your question directly, students really can't avoid it. They're going to have to take, uh, at a minimum, their ELSJ, which is their experiential learning class. They'll have to take that at Santa Clara University. Um, there are a number of other classes that all students have to take. Some transfer students are able to substitute for a civic engagement class. But the way the core is designed, there are some classes they can get through high school credit. but almost all students, civic engagement will be taken at Santa Clara. The exception might be a study abroad. They might be able to take the class while doing study abroad. Um, so all students, because they have to take it, I think there is a, um, there's general warmth towards it from, from the students. They, they, they know that it's a component of their education. I don't get, you know, um, it's, I think because every student is going to have to take it at the school, they are, they feel like equal in that regard um, towards, uh, towards taking it. Um, they, um, are supposed to take classes, not in a certain order, but generally at a certain time. So they have about six or seven classes. They're supposed to take the first year of school. Um, they they have a number of classes, um, that are called explorations that includes a civic engagement class. Um, ideally they're taking these in their second or third year. Not all students do it that way. Some of them take it really early on. Some of them might wait to the last quarter, although it's usually natural science they're waiting to the last quarter to take. Uh, not their civic engagement class. And um, the ELSJ class, the idea is that they're taking this as um, towards the end, it is supposed to be kind of like a summative experience and they're, you know, they're, they're 
using it as to, to look back on what they're doing. I think what generally happens is that the seniors who have uh, priority and registration end up taking the ELSJ classes that they, they like the most. And because of that, students are often waiting till they get like their preference, you know, to preferential um, um, registration. So you tend to see most students taking it towards the end of their career. Um, I will say some students also take two ELSJ classes. So it is a class that requires a um, more of a, um, it, it, it demands more time from the student. Uh, again, they are going to be in the community at least 16 hours. It's usually more than that. And um, because of that, you know, they're not just looking at their their class times. They're also looking at when the classes have to meet outside the class time, which is, you know, about a couple hours a week. And so, um, you know, the fact that students take multiple ELSJs, even though it is a high time demand, I think speaks to how much they appreciate that. Um, and I've heard students speak very highly about their ELSJs. I, it's rare that students will complain afterwards. Um, as the core director, I get a lot of feedback from students, complaints and otherwise. Um, the ELSJ is not, not the requirement I get complaints about. I get a lot of positive feedback from students about the impact it's had on them. And I think um, that just speaks to how important it is. Yeah, I think students are telling us they want to do things they think matter. Right, and if we can give them experiences that that matter, where they're pursuing questions that matter to them, um, yeah. it makes it relevant. And and it's great for them to have common experiences just to bond around. That's part of belonging, yeah. right? At at your institution. So I I appreciate that. Thank you. Um, my next question is to Carrie and Philip at Elon, and this is about kind of how you involve others in in the work in order to sort of help infuse this throughout the institution. So to what degree would you say that the, the key stakeholders on your campus are committed to civic learning, contribute to civic learning and democratic engagement? So is there really high level tangible support from administration? Do a majority of faculty contribute? Who's involved among the staff? That kind of thing. I'll start and then Philip, you can add in whatever I forget. Okay. Um, we have tremendous support from our administration. Um, on a staff level, we have a, a the Kernodal Center for Civic Life. They've rebranded themselves recently, Civic Life, moving away from that service learning um, sort of label. And their staff, Philip and I both work very closely with them in our programming. I co-chair a council on civic engagement that is made up of faculty who are doing this work staff across the university who are involved in um, civic engagement in many ways, administrators, and we have some students as well. And we meet um, two or three times a semester to work on policies. Information sharing, I think, is really important to make sure that we don't end up in these little silos duplicating work or that there's just strength in numbers and combining our efforts. Um, so the Council on Civic Engagement has been an important tool for that to Mama. share information and then we just have tremendous support. Uh, the president of the university once casually mentioned to my voting ambassador students that she'd do whatever she could for them. And before I knew it, the students had set up a one-on-one -on -one meeting with the president of the university where she willingly agreed to provide additional resources that they were looking for for our voting efforts. Um, so we have tremendous support if we need it. What else would you include, Philip? Uh, I think you've hit most of it, but I think that one of the things I love about Elon is it's a low walls kind of place. It's low walls with faculty, staff. I don't feel very often that there's a big barrier there, like I think there probably is at other institutions. Um, and I think my staff colleagues often echo that, so I, it's not just from my side. I, I feel like that that's being stated. Um, I think that's also true uh, with the community, although I'd love for those walls to be as low as possible in, in some future day where they don't see us as the private liberal arts school. It, you know, in this corner of the, the city, they see us maybe as a public institution and they just wander on campus as if we were in a way that they felt that, that free to do so. I, I think that would be a beautiful thing. I'm not sure we're there yet, but I think we're working towards that. The other two things I would say is, as Carrie mentioned a minute ago, our, our most recent strategic plan is called Boldly Elon, which has language laced all through it about the community. One of them, and I'm paraphrasing here, Carrie, you can state it correctly if I get it wrong, but is that we'll strive to prepare all students for community engagement and that that's a major goal of the university. And then one other thing that I will add is that um, 
similar to Carrie, I co-chair a um, faculty and staff advisory committee for service learning and community engagement that does very similar things to what Carrie mentioned with her council on civic engagement, but more towards the curricular stuff. And it is both faculty and staff, so it is not faculty exclusive. Thank you. I love that concept of low walls, right? A low walls institution internally for internal relationships um, and, and external relationships. I mean, I think that's built in scaffolding for, for civic engagement and collaboration. Um, well, now I'll go to what I know is everybody's favorite, favorite question, <laughs> which I've saved for Bill. I don't know if he feels like he drew the short straw or what, but um, my question for Bill is, if you have assessed civic learning outcomes, how did you go about it? Um, what have you learned so far and how are you applying that to continuing to improve those practices? How are you closing the loop to use that, that wonderful phrase? Yeah, assessment, our, 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 everyone's favorite thing. I think oftentimes assessment is done for assessment sake, but I think using those assessment results has been really important. And I think that's what we have done in recent years here. Um, we're doing a number of things, thinking about our civic learning and our civic engagement. Uh, one thing we've recently implemented is we are actually adding an assessment to advising meetings. So every student in their junior year, uh, their advisor will meet with them. So it's not every, every time you meet with your advisor, it's just this one specific meeting your junior year. Um, and we have questions, kind of guided questions to see where students are on a number of different things. And one of them is with the civic learning. And uh, we are now using that data to think about, well, how, where, where are we? And how do we then, how are we going to use this data to revise our learning program? Right now, we're about to get a new president, a new provost over the next, uh, starting next year. So we know things will change. So we're not using this data currently to make the changes, but we're using it so we can make changes in the right way um, as we are making the assumed changes to our, our learning programs. But so we're collecting that data and we're what we are finding to begin with is students are very engaged. They're seeing the connections between what they do in the classroom to the community and they're having those experiences. So we're pretty happy with where that is. In other ways, uh, we collect data every year on our student feedback form. So any course that has uh, a civic engagement component, we collect data on that every semester. Um, and also with the Odyssey program, every project a student completes, we collect our assessment data on that partially to think about what their engagement level is. Uh, currently, one of my tasks this year is based on that data is saying, well, we think we have, we have this level of engagement. It's pretty good, but we'd like to see it better, especially in that civic, uh, civic engagement. So we're using those results to kind of rewrite and modify the learning goals of the program, but also, well, what do our categories actually say? There are six different Odyssey categories. Students have to complete three of them while at Hendrix. Well, how do we rewrite the category descriptions to really promote and engage with students in this way? So we're kind of, we're using the data to make changes. None of these are major like program, program wide changes. We're kind of making small incremental changes right now, uh, but I think having that data and using our assessment results have informed these small changes. And I think sometimes those small changes are really what can make you know, the biggest difference. We're not trying to completely overhaul a program, but can we improve it incrementally right now is where we are based on that data. Thanks. I can say, um, as a new VPAA who came in here the same day as a brand new president, new people appreciate data. <laughs> we like having some data to learn from um, as we come in. So um, I think that's that's wonderful, and I'm glad you're seeing some positive some positive results. Um, well, before we move to sort of Q and A with all of you who have been such great listeners, I have just two more questions um, for our panelists, for any or all of you. 
Um, this is sort of about what more we can learn from your experience um, and why that matters while we're here. And my first question is a little bit self-serving, um, but I bet others will also be interested um, in the answer. And that is, what advice would you give an institution like mine, like Roanoke College, where we have pockets of really good practice, but no intentional structure in place yet to connect the dots with regard to civic learning specifically? So anybody is free to jump in on that. Or I'm not averse I, to picking on people. So come on. No, I don't have an answer. I really have a, another question. And, and maybe it's for you, Andrew, but it's similar in that. You know, Elon has the required ELRs. The students have to have two before they graduate, but it doesn't necessarily dictate what buckets they choose from. We have those five buckets. Um, so how to, and it sounds like with, with you all, you've more mandated a certain type of bucket, if you will. Um, and within that uh, a question that we struggle with, which I think is a related question, but a little different is how do we, um, for your heavy hitters, for your repeat uh, students who are taking multiple of the classes that you described, how do we ensure that we're not sort of repeating that entry level, whatever it is? So in, in my case, it would be, how do we not do the service learning 101 over and over and over? How do we scaffold that where there might be a first year experience that's community engaged, has civic engagement, and then a sophomore to junior level, and then maybe more of a senior level that's more advanced, more rigorous, maybe it's more critical service learning. It's deeper into social justice issues. But what we're struggling with right now is how do we how do we offload or how or can we offload some of the starter level stuff, if you will, to some other mechanism to where we can then get in more individualized experiences or more advanced experiences for students? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I'm going to speak as a communication instructor now uh, in our department. We just re, uh, redid our curriculum and we included a lot more scaffolding to address some of these issues. Um, we don't want to in research methods, upper division, we don't want to keep teaching the same basic part of, of research methods. So we've created a separate intro to research class that students will take. Um, and I'm thinking about that as we look towards our next iteration of the core curriculum, that um, there are some classes that were supposed to be scaffolded. It's actually written into our, not requirements, it's written into the, the handbook or the guidebook for the core curriculum, but it ended up not being scaffolded. For example, natural science, Students are supposed to take that before they take science, technology, and society. They're supposed to. They don't. Uh, civic engagement is supposed to be taken before ELSJ. It's not. It doesn't always happen that way. It generally happens that way, but it doesn't always. So I would think that there's a way to implement more of, potentially implement more of the service learning uh, curriculum into one of those earlier classes. But again, then that's going to require implementing then potentially multiple courses into a general education um, structure, which I which I know is really challenging. I mean, it, adding classes to general education is really hard to do. So um, I gave you an answer, but then I kind of took it back. <laughs> well, but Stay similarly, tuned on it's how hard that turns to mandate. Um, for example, we have a course that all first year students take called Core 1100. It's like, you know, world global issues and the world you know broad understanding of why you're a college student in this geopolitical etc cetera, etc cetera. and i have a colleague that wants to do sort of a, a small amount but it's still some community engagement activities in that course okay great for the students great for the topic of the course and maybe great as sort of that icebreaker or entry into civic and community engagement okay i love it so much now i want all the core 1100 faculty to teach it and they're going to balk yeah. Right. They're not all going to want to do it. So like trying to like mandate it across that course or some other kind of course is also equally challenging, I think, to adding new courses to your curriculum because people don't necessarily want to be told how to teach their classes. Or, or oh, that right? Yeah, I've never experienced that. I don't, don't want to be told. That. Yeah. <laughs> Bill, you were going to jump in there early on. I was uh, just going to say like back to the the initial where you have pockets of good practice and no intentional structure. I think the first kind of what we've done at Hendricks, and this is before my time here, but we had that. We had pockets and 
of good practice? How do we put it all together? Um, I think the first step is kind of identifying what each of those are and then figuring out, well, how do they connect together, right? Because I think that there's these pockets of good practice, what links them together in some ways, it's almost you got to build a little concept map of here's this, it links in these ways. And I think it's finding the right people with that, with that participate in these to help build what, how do they link together and how can it be kind of formalized into a, whether it's a program or an office or whatever it is, but, or how do you continue to build it? But I think finding those common threads between the good practices is, is the important thing there. And that, that will help connect it together. Thank yeah, you. I'm going to echo what Bill just said, because that was sort of where I was thinking is um, it's we did some like mapping in our council on civic engagement a year or so ago, where we just sort of sat around and tried to brainstorm and come up with where are all these pockets that this work is happening? And are we hearing from those people? Are we trying to make sure that's all included? Um, so having that sort of core team that's multi-level, right, faculty, staff, administrators, students, and then really trying to spend some time mapping out where you already have good things so you can make those connections is I think the probably the best place to start. Yeah, I think taking that inventory when I was yeah. at Nebraska Wesley and it was about where is global learning or if we were doing capstones, what's already in common? We don't even know yet. So it's, yeah, starting with just knowing what you have and then figuring out how it all connects, I think is great advice. Um, well, well, since this is a session about liberal arts colleges specifically, um, I, I'd love to hear from you about why you think it's particularly important for civic learning and democratic engagement to take place in the context of a liberal arts education. So um, in what ways do you see small liberal arts colleges being really well positioned to provide this kind of learning to all students? I think one of the things about a liberal arts college for me that really prepares us and get students in there is we're, we're already to begin with looking at that very broad uh, education. It's not, you're not gonna come in and do science and only take science classes. I have friends that did that and you know, they took over their, took 30 different physics classes while in college or that's a slight exaggeration, but um, things like that. Whereas at a liberal arts college, there's a lot of other requirements that spread you out across the curriculum. And I think having that broad education really helps, helps us think about where we are and engage civic in that civic environment. Uh, so I think that's really important that positions us well to kind of develop that in students and get students engaged. I think they're already primed for it when they come to a college uh, college like this. And whereas at many institutions, they might come in like I'm doing this one thing, the liberal arts college, it's a little, a little less siloed from the student perspective. Thanks, anybody else wanna jump in on that? I'll just say uh, really quick that the thing that I love about community engaged courses, ones where they, they get out of the classroom and they engage in the community in some capacity, it might be local to the university, it might be in a study away or abroad um, circumstance, is that it problematizes the curriculum in ways that are positive, meaning I think we've trained ourselves and our students to be really good at solving problems as long as you write it down on a project sheet and define it very, very carefully for them first. But the real world doesn't work that way. The real world says first, hey, there's this thing out here, it might be a problem, we don't even know, but go tangle with it for a while and first define what the issue is, then go about solving it. I think we're doing our students and ourselves a disservice on some level because we're already giving them the problem. Okay, so community engagement and, and any anything that's sort of authentic and experiential like that and internships and other things, co-op programs also do this, sort of complicate the issue for students. They, they're messier, they're not as defined, right? It's the design thinking, ill-defined problem kind of thing. That's harder for students, but it's good. It gets them out of their comfort zone. It asks them to do things that they don't routinely have to do in class, like identify that problem. I mean, that's a beautiful thing. And a lot of that, you don't have to do that yourself as the instructor or the facilitator. You just have to set up the conditions for it. 
the community or the engagement will take will provide that for you like that that messiness and i think that's a beautiful thing it's hard to create in other ways i feel like i'm really good at making up fake projects for students but to what end right like the real world has what they you know what i mean like we need to prepare them for the comp complexness of the real world and sometimes i'm oversimplifying it when i make up that easy you know that straightforward project so that's right. what i love about it yeah i think graduating well informed broadly informed citizens who have practiced wrestling with messy unscripted problems is is probably a great advantage to democracy kind of going going forward andrew did you want to contribute something to that can you top that i i can't top it. no i agree i think i think yeah. i think everything said makes sense that's true thank you um okay well folks thank you so much for for listening to our panelists explain what's happening on their institutions. But I want to um, give you an opportunity to have a conversation with these folks. So um, as you do, Natalie, I think you can probably unpin us and then we can maybe see everyone or most people in the room together. Um, so if you have a question, feel free to raise your Zoom hand and I think Natalie can help uh, identify folks that, that I can't see, or you can feel free to put a question in the chat. Um, and when we call on you, if you would introduce yourself, let us know where you are from. That would be great. So who would like to jump in first? No one does. I have plenty of questions, but I want to hear from you all first. Who's curious? Um, hello, Ryan Solomon from Grinnell College in Iowa. Um, my question is, so in lots of ways, um, you know, I, I want to celebrate the work that you're doing and, um, and uh, you know, particularly the fact that you've been able to institutionalize a lot of that work in the curriculum. Um, but, but I also, you know, one of the things I'd love to hear your perspective on is that means a lot of students are doing community engagement which on principle could be a good thing, but in a context where that often translates into volunteerism, and now you have to provide some kind of community engagement to lots of different students with varying needs to your community in a short amount of time, how do you go about doing that in a way that is reciprocal to the community, that moves from simple volunteering into more substantive engagement? Are there any lessons that you've learned as you've tried to build this into your curriculum? Thanks, Ryan. Who would like to take that one? Does anyone do a particular kind of um, orientation? Do you involve your community partners um, in mutually designing learning experiences for students, for example? I'll speak from Elon just for a minute that we have all of that in in a way that's maybe both positive and negative meaning we have courses and experiences where the whole course partners with one entity we have some where the the faculty member is trying to balance seven eight nine community partners for a group of 25 or 30 students which seems kind of crazy to me but i'm not teaching the class um i think ryan to your question we have what i will just call some heavy hitter um, disciplines for example, our human service studies major, a public health major, school of education are very active in the community for probably obvious reasons. We also have on the other side, heavy hitter community partners that take a lot of um, engagement and are willing. Um, I often wonder, you know, are they just not good at saying no sometimes? So that's a worry. Um, and then we're always thinking a lot about, I'm not sure we always solve it well, but always thinking about, are we over? burdening community partners, um, trying to keep our eye on the reciprocity side of it, and trying to involve the community as much as possible in their needs and their stated desires or things that were, are working uh, by asking lots of questions and giving them lots of opportunities for feedback and inviting them into a variety of forums to, to contribute and to feel like true partners who can express their needs, but acknowledging that we're not always getting it right, for sure. 
and that there are there are opportunities for I'll just say misuse, um, probably by no no design, but by by volume that that is always a continual challenge. Yeah, I think living in in smaller places, right? Is there community capacity, right, to absorb the kind of community based learning that people want to do? And I'm wondering if um, virtual opportunities um, open up some space uh, for for schools that are that are in that situation. So, I'll just chime in real quick and add that you know we have that line in our strategic plan, prepare all students, but we're trying to think really carefully that that doesn't mean all students need to be out volunteering in the community. Like there are other ways to be preparing them to go out and be active citizens. So we're trying to think um, strategically about who those um, experiences are right for and other ways to prepare students outside of that. Thank you. And one of the things you mentioned kind of is how do we at Hendrix, how do we ensure it goes kind of beyond simple volu just volunteering, which of course is a valuable thing, uh, but from the Odyssey perspective, um, students that participate in a service project or service to the world project, when they, they have to propose their project, they develop learning goals. So they develop their own set of learning goals for the project. So beyond, I'm going to participate with this group, I'm going to be volunteering with this group, the students have to develop their learning goals. Those um, are approved by their project supervisor. They're approved by my office. Um, and then they go off and do the project. And that has to be set up before they begin. So kind of the intentionality of it is really important. And then at the end, when they're done, another required component is they have to do some sort of reflection that could be a paper, that could be a conversation, it could take on a number of things, but they have to think back on what they did and what they got out of it, what they learned by doing it. So kind of that intentionality, learning goals and reflection at the end um, helps ensure that these are all high quality experiences for the student who participates, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, but also for uh, the community partners that are involved, they're going to get somebody who is highly engaged working with them, not somebody just looking to do a certain number of hours. Thanks, Bill. Thanks, Ryan, for getting us started. Other questions? Oh, go ahead, Andrew. I was going to add, you know, we're, we're, we're fortunate at Santa Clara that we have a, a center for Jesuit education that helps with community placements. Um, I'm just going to share here the let's see I'm trying to share the right so here here's a here's a page in which um that i'm sharing in the in the chat in which they they've worked with community partners um to have these connections that i'm i'm fortunate i don't have to go out and make the connections for the students um about two thirds of our students work with these community partners that they, that go through this uh ignatian center and the other third um are found by the the instructors of the classes so I don't know if that helps uh, add some color to it. Thank you. Who else has a curiosity? I don't know if this is a curiosity per se, but um, one thing that I would like to contribute is that sometimes, maybe this is the former debater in me, we have to sell this to our students. And sometimes the best way to do it is not necessarily with these are all the learning outcomes, but this is the tangible benefits you're going to get from this experience. So for example, I have a student who we did a service learning um, project with an organization in town. She ended up really connecting well with them. She got an internship with them and then that internship turned into a job. So from that little class service learning project, she ended up being, you know, having a, a job opportunity from that. So I know it's maybe not what y'all want to hear that we don't, shouldn't maybe, you know, just focusing on the learning outcomes is maybe not what the students want to hear. And so we can sneak in some other ways to talk the students into the value of this as well. Right. Yeah, I think their, their civic lives and their professional and personal lives will intersect right throughout um and so i think yeah the the ways that we can integrate this learning not only through our general education curricula and co-curriculum but through the majors 
um, and then career development, um, thinking about career paths is, is important. Thank you. And Hastings College, <laughs> shout out to Nebraska. <laughs> Related to that, um, one thing that we, Hendrix, that we do, um, we are very focused right now on comp career competencies and all of this is done in heavy collaboration with our um, career services office. I'm, you know, in my office in Odyssey, I'm right down the hall from them and we regularly collaborate with them and discuss internships, of course, but, you know, what are the competencies they're building and how will these things that they do in service or other things help them as they search, search for jobs, search for careers, develop skills that will be of benefit to them. So we do focus on that as well, kind of the competencies and thinking about that long-term outcome for the students, uh, what else they get out of it. So I think that's, that's another really important thing. Thank you. All right. Floor is open, folks. Whether it is a question, or if you think you have a really great strategy on your campus that none of us has talked about, I think we can all learn from each other here. It's not just a one-way street. So I'll ask a question, actually, and maybe some of you would have some advice. Uh, at Hastings College, we've moved to a block system. So we're not on a semester system any longer. It's complicated, some of our service learning, because we don't have you know, a full semester to do more in-depth service learning. So do any of you have, I've actually had to ditch some of my service learning that I had done before because it just can't be accomplished in our shorter block system. We had a, I worked with the literacy center in town and my students um, did ELL, helped with the ELL classes. They don't really want to collaborate anymore because by the time they do the orientation training, you know, and all of that. It's just not a long enough time where it's worth their effort. So if anyone has any ideas for um, shorter term versus longer term, I prefer the more substantive service learning projects where students have a lot of time during the semester, but um, I need ideas for how can you take the longer ones, make them shorter, but still as valuable. And is that one block? at a time a la Colorado College where you do nine blocks a year kind of thing, three and a half weeks, four weeks a block? Um, right now we have six blocks. So it's two, a two week block, which is essentially mostly for the first year students. Uh, seven week block, a seven week block. Then in the spring, it's seven to seven. And also in the two week blocks, that's when students do the travel courses. And so basically our- Two at a time, one at a time? one or two, the credits for the full semester would still be the same once you add it all together. Well, I don't have a good answer. I mean, I get your challenge. Elon has a January term, so we get one block a year and it's both an awesome thing and it's a challenge to challenge in the intensity, but I love it because it's, students only have one ball in the air. They can't tell you they have somebody's test and that's why they screwed up your project because they don't, right? It's just your thing. And I have been fortunate to teach a, a international service learning kind of experience in that three and a half week block in which we travel for about a week and then we come back and build a project and Andrew is very much a communications kind of project so we're building a website for a community partner usually in Central America or in the Caribbean or somewhere and it it's a super intense accelerated all day all the time kind of experience and it's exhausting but students produce amazing work in three and a half weeks they get even though that experience with the community in on location is relatively short, just a week or so, they still have very deep engagement with community there. So it's, it's not really traveling like we think of traveling. It's community engagement just happens to be in another context. So they get they meet people where they are. There's lots of positive things about it. It's also sort of a nice um, mashup of the community engagement, high impact practice and the global learning high impact practice smashed into one three and a half week box. It's intense, though. I mean, I don't know. I'd want to do it every every block all year long. You'd be worn out. But for some, I think for some circumstances, it can work well. And others, like what you were describing, where there's this long sort of entry period, that might be harder. Feels like co-curricularly, it might work. 
right? Sort of like on a Bonner model where, you know, students start with sort of low stakes connections and then build that kind of responsibility and connection with a, with a place and organization over time, so. I wonder, um, hi, sorry, I joined very late. Um, Maddie Carrera, I'm at uh, Hamilton College, um, Director of Experiential Learning. Um, I wonder, one of the things that we're starting to do is kind of like a scaffolded thing that connects all of these smaller pieces along their entire time at the college. Um, we're calling it the, the engaged scholars because we don't have a better name for it yet. Um, but it's basically they start small, they have reflection courses that they do, but uh, they have to do one type of thing per year. Um, and it culminates in this um, kind of, uh, I don't, for want of a better word, like a TED Talk conference where they present um, their e-portfolios and, and their reflections of, of what their whole four years has looked like. So I wonder if that might help and bridge some of those short-term things and also make it more of a benefit for your community partners who want something long lasting because then there's a bit of a carrot to get students to keep going even if the academic side um, falters or stops. Just a thought. When I saw that Maddie was here, I was going to pick on her to say, how are you doing this at a place that requires nothing <laughs> outside the major, right? How do you connect the dots? It's a struggle. You, you you figure out where they already are doing things and find ways to add on to that. Yeah. <laughs> Let it be a challenge to you. Yes. Um, I think we might have time for one more short question if anyone has one. I do have a, a quick, is anyone connecting with um, K-12 folks in your area on what they're doing with civic learning and bridging to what you do at your institution? And that's for panelists or anyone. Are you asking for specific ideas of things? Yeah, or, or just in general, like are you, are you in touch with K-12 partners? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so... I teach a class in intercultural communication. Um, this last semester, my students wrote multicultural children's books. They researched the topics, they um, designed the illustrations, the whole thing. And then at the end of the block, we went to a, an elementary school, read them in three different third grade classrooms, um, basically as a focus group. Uh, so that the students could get feedback. They had discussions afterwards. Um, it just takes a lot of pre-planning because the K through 12, they have so many different standards they have to accomplish for them to work with you on extra stuff. I had three schools say no to me just because they couldn't fit it in uh, until I found a school who was willing to do it. Right. That project makes my heart feel great. <laughs> we love it. I love, I love ending on that. Well, we are at time, so would you please join me in thanking our intrepid panelists for sharing their experiences with designing campus structures for civic learning um, and democratic engagement. And just to go back to that original framework, right, keeping in mind that um, this kind of adaptive curricular change for civic learning is intended to help our students thrive and help our institutions thrive, and in this case, to help our democracy to thrive. So thank you very much for doing the work um, and for being interested in sharing your knowledge um, and working with colleagues to improve civic learning at liberal arts institutions. Um, appreciate your being here, everybody. Have a great day. Thank you, Natalie, for all your help. And we'll see you at a future forum. Thank you.